Sejam bem-vindas, sejam bem-vindos à live. Welcome all to our presentation, Smart Cities, Technology and Democracy. My name is Catarine Flor. I am Communication Advisor at Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, Brazil office. This is an online event organized by Fundação Rosa Luxemburgo in partnership with Editora Umbu and the Brazilian Institute of Architecture. The transmission streaming is available on YouTube and Facebook, and I would like to thank you all for being here. Before uh, getting started, I'll tell you a little bit about Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. It's a German institution with 23 offices around the world, and we ties with the D-Link, a left-wing party from Germany. And since um, we've been doing a lot of work to foster critical thinking here. And one of the books we have been fostering is Passe Livre, a book by Daniel Santini, a project coordinator um, working with us. And you can buy the book or you can even download it from our website. And today we're here to discuss this book, which has been edited by Rosa Luxemburg Foundation in partnership with Editora Ubu and people who have read the book please comment on the book on the comments below tell us what are the the highlights and what are your expectations for the um, debate with the authors of the book the name of the book in English is uh, smart city urban technologies and democracy and at the end of our presentation you can log in our website rosalux.com.br and then you can download this book for us to continue and uh, start our conversation i would like to invite florencia ferrari she's a representative of ubu publishing house hello florencia uh, Florence, your microphone is off. Hello, Katarini. I'm sorry. I always do that. I start talking and my phone is on mute. Hello, guys. My name is Florence Ferrari. And I would like to thank Danielle Sancini for the idea for this event. And I would like to welcome Francesca Bria and Eugeni Morozov. The first contact I had with Eugeni was in 2017 when I sent him a message on some of very insightful essays he had written in English and had never been published into Brazilian Portuguese. And after some time, we organized this book, Big Tech. And Big Tech is the rise of data and the death of politics and we launched it in 2018 and um it was it came as a surprise to me when i learned that he speaks portuguese and it was really fun to send messages to him in portuguese in 2019, Daniel Sancini, um, he suggested that we translated um, smart cities, urban technologies and democracy, and we've translated it into Portuguese, and Evzgini and Mourouzov and Francesca Bria, they're the authors, and it was wonderful for us to publish the book and we saw that the Brazilian audience was eager to read more about smart cities. I would like to welcome both of you and have a wonderful debate. Thank you, Florencia. Thank you, Catarini. Thank you both for introducing our presentation. And I would like to reinforce what, highlight what Florencia has already said. It's such a pleasure to have Elves Givini, Morozov, and Francesca Bria with us today. And it's great to hear from you. You're a reference on smart cities, on data. And Rosa Luxemburg Foundation was interested in launching a book in partnership with Ubu Publishing House, um, especially because we got in touch with the book that was published 
in um, connection with the New York office for Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. And it's such an important debate, not only for Brazil, but for but worldwide. And it's fundamental debate, who controls cities, how cities are organized, what role does technology play? And this, um, um, Sergio Amadeu wrote a text in this book, and it's good because you go beyond introducing the idea of smart cities, and you go into details to talk about um, all of this information, the fact that cities are, um, there are plenty of info and data for cities. Currently, we have a partnership with UBU and also a partnership with the Institute for Brazilian Architects. And we believe it's core that architects and urban planners um, come together and reflect upon uh, all of those issues. So first, we had invited Elvjevini Morozov and Francesca Bria to come over to Brazil and be here with us. And we, we really want to have you over in Brazil one day, and I hope we can have you over maybe next year in 2021 or the moment we have the opportunity to have you here in brazil with us it would be such a great pleasure to um, talk in person and ever since we launched the idea of the event many people showed interest in learning more from you and um I think that uh, the, the interest of Brazilian audience is a good reason for you to spend some carbon footprint and come over to Brazil and join us in the debate. And, and I think it's such an important exchange of ideas. Uh, some people are going to interact with us. Uh, Facebook and um, YouTube channels are sharing this event online for Rosa Luxemburg Brazil office, um, Ubu Publishing House, and also the Institute for Brazilian Architects. So people, the audience, are going to send us some messages and questions. And I would like to start by um, giving the floor to Evgeny Morozov. I would like to hear more from you. Um, he speaks Portuguese, but um, feel free to speak either English or Portuguese. I. I believe that, um, Francesca, we won't be able to do that for Italian, but Morozov, if you feel like speaking um, Portuguese, go ahead. Francesca is going to listen to the interpretation into English. And please introduce yourself and tell a bit more about the project, uh, the syllabus project that you're carrying out. and. Um, Tell us also about the book, and it's a beautiful edition. It's one of the most beautiful books we've published last year. And I would like to hear about producing the book and uh, about what you've been doing on syllables in your project. Welcome, Elf Zaghini. Good afternoon. Thank you for introducing me. Now I'll speak English to make it easier for us to have a debate, especially uh, have a debate uh, with Francesca Brea, but probably I'll answer the questions in English, in Portuguese. Again, to thank you for organizing this. It's uh, remarkable to finally have this chance to speak to the Brazilian public. And it's a pity we couldn't uh, make it happen uh, in uh, real life. Um, maybe let me just outline a little bit the background uh, to this book. Uh, both myself and uh, Francesca, we have been um, quite preoccupied with the growing power of so-called big tech. Uh, so this big uh, technology platforms that have rapidly 
uh, entered our everyday life, uh, but also our politics, uh, our economics, our healthcare systems, and are rapidly transforming them uh, by means of artificial intelligence and cloud computing and uh, all things smart, right? It's not just smart cities. We're talking about uh, smart working a lot in Italy, but also we, you always hear this talk about smart objects, smart houses, smart cars. Everything seems to be getting smart. Uh, and uh, under the this uh, very appealing label, there is usually um, power relations, right? There is uh, somebody who is essentially draining us of our data and uh, then uses that data for something else. So I think before we embarked upon this project with Francesca, it was clear to us that some, there was some structural transformation, if you will, not of the public sphere, but of society at large that was happening because of this new digital players. And of course, the city as um, uh, kind of a focal point of a lot of anti-systemic movements, of a lot of contestation of the neoliberal paradigm as a focal point to essentially push for new innovative ideas. Some of them might not be new, like remunicipalization, for example, but nonetheless, they're very important to struggles of social movements. They're very important to bottom up activity and it was obvious that there would be some kind of a clash, right, between this bottom-up logic of people in cities uh, trying to get some democratic change, because in many cases, the nation state was not delivering this democratic change. So people uh, obviously turned to cities. And of course, in the European context, but you've also experienced something similar in Brazil during the, when was it, 2013 protests about public transportation, there was a lot of anger in people, uh, especially after the financial crisis because of evictions, because of the fact that, you know, the banks were being bailed out and people had to be evicted from the houses. And that in Europe, of course, led to a lot of progressive movements becoming uh, very important and powerful in cities. One of which was, of course, Barcelona. And Francesca will tell you a little bit more about it. But again, to get back to this kind of dialectic between the bottom up uh, insistence and desire for democracy, and on the one hand, the centralized effort to impose the smart city paradigm as part of this overall rolling out of digitization, this clash between the two, it provided an interesting opening for us to reflect upon uh, what can be done and what kind of obstacles the emergence of this new smart digital paradigm presents to progressive radical movements that were uh, trying to enact the right to the city at the local level, that were demanding radical democracy in everyday uh, urban life. So uh, what we do in this book is, on the one hand, uh, I, in a more theoretical manner, explore some of the reasons for the emergence of big tech as a powerful political force. Um, and I also kind of try to draw the conclusions from it. So, uh, you know, I look, uh, we look in the book, but also in subsequent writings at the way in which big tech now became an industry that attracts a lot of capital from uh, essentially uh, you know big asset managers uh, sovereign wealth funds so a lot of idle global capital now needs an outlet because the global economy does not deliver uh, so instead of investing in government bonds they turn to uh, you know the stocks of this huge massive tech companies so there are a lot of complicated relations that are not just relations of you know everyday urban infrastructure that we need to understand, for example, how and why a company like Uber uh, manages to penetrate our cities and keep losing money and still remain in business, right? So for us, it was very important to understand how is it that Uber, a company that loses five to seven billion dollars every year, still remains such a powerful force in local economies and seeks to displace uh, all the other uh, more informal or national actors, right? And that clearly has to do with their deep pockets. And to understand their deep pockets, you really need to understand why would the government of Saudi Arabia uh, give money to, uh, for example, SoftBank, which would then uh, pass them on further to uh, SoftBank, to Uber, right? So there are some of this, uh, 
relations that we explore at the global level at the more kind of intermediate national level uh, there is of course also this fetish with the tech as the engine of innovation we all want to promote startups we all want to promote co-working spaces and so forth so it was very important to understand how does that intersect with this uh, growing insistence that cities have to be smart that they have to be efficient that they have to be surveyed right because very often this is what smart actually refers to once might not make a lot of sense in portuguese but in english i think it does i used smart as an basically as an abbreviation as an acronym and i said that smart if you look at the first letters of this uh, it means uh, surveillance marketed as revolutionary technology so you end up with the word smart right so uh, very often this is what smart is and was so it was very important to understand also why for example the government of india would uh, embrace the smart city as their developmental paradigm so they would pour billions into inviting mckinsey and others to roll out 100 smart cities in india right we don't tackle all of these questions in depth in the book but they kind of form part of this overall problematic of the smart city as something that uh, requires broader and deeper reflection from the left uh, but also from progressive forces including those that run uh, city governments which uh, up until now have perceived it mostly as some kind of an economic vehicle to become uh, more competitive or to get better ranking and all sorts of city indexes and so forth we argue that there was something else at stake and that something has to do with the very nature of democracy and kind of urban contestation so maybe that's the first kind of chapter where I can uh, pass the word to Francesca and she will also reflect maybe on the Barcelona experience because she was actually working in Barcelona on the ground as she was writing this book. Thank you, Evgeny, and thanks uh, to all of you and Rosa Luxemburg Brazil for organizing this event. Uh, first of all, let me say that I'm particularly pleased to talk to a Brazilian audience uh, for many reasons. And one of them is that uh, for some years and uh, quite a few years ago, uh, I think it was maybe the second uh, government of Lula or um, even the first at some point, I was, I've been working for quite some time in Brazil. Uh, with people like Sergio Amadeo, but also with uh, Gilberto Gil and his team. And I have to say that uh, Brazil has been always a reference point and a laboratory for uh, democratic innovation and for participatory practices, also in the digital space. So we learned a lot from, from communities and fr from your radical experiments uh, about a new democratic digital culture. Um, for instance, with the Pontos de Cultura, but not only. And uh, we learned from the participatory budgeting experiments that you ran at some point at very large scale in Brazil. And we also learned from the free software movement and from it, some kind of um, very clear strategy that Brazil had at some point about, I would call it endogenous development of technology or what today we call digital sovereignty. So this was something starting from the very infrastructures, the very critical, the democratic control of the digital infrastructures uh, to the production of culture, of in endogenous culture, to the creation of large scale um, communities that were able to take back the control of technology i want to say that we learned a lot from brazil so um i just want to remind that uh and um and i'm also well of course we are having this meeting digitally so i'm definitely looking forward at some point to come to brazil and uh, have the possibility to interact uh, again in person and um, i think all this conversation about how we after the pandemic uh, what is the role of cities and how cities communities and citizens themselves will be part of building a recovery, a restart, and re redirecting our societies and economies in a very different way. 
I think uh, it's going to be something that we have to practice together. So it's going to be about, you know, us recomponing a kind of global movement around these questions. Um, I maybe want to start from uh, the motivation behind the book a little bit and then uh, focus on the kind of policy aspect and why, uh, you know, on a certain point, me and Evgeny from different um, aspects, we started to collaborate to basically see uh, what we uh, didn't get right in terms of theoretical understanding about digital capitalism, but what we had to experiment in practice in order to get a, a clear idea for radical alternative projects. And, and it happened that, you know, at, at that point I was in Barcelona and uh, I was part of the uh, Ada Colau government. And then, mm, you know, this book was written when Evgeny was developing uh, lots of different um, theoretical understanding of um, contemporary capitalism and, and the power of big tech and digital capitalism, but also the, 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 the limits of social democracy and the limits of a lot of the different uh, projects projects that the left was um, you know putting forward as an alternative to rapacious capitalism I would say and uh, I was there in the government with Ada Colau from a very kind of municipal bottom-up uh, radical movement we were experimenting um, alternative projects that could be uh, maybe part of the of the answer to some of the of the of the questions that Evgeny was uh, was uh, busy with um, and I have to say maybe this kind of interplay between uh, policy practice and theory it's something that we are missing today because sometimes you know we have this preconce preconceived uh, theoretical framework uh, but we do not have the possibility to experiment them I mean either with social movements but also inside the institutional space taking back political power in order to experiment and put forward this idea and test them in practice, which I think it's what it is so valuable about cities and what has been so valuable about the Barcelona experiment. So as Evgeny was saying, I think the, we were very worried that a lot of these um, uh, social movements reclaiming housing with the right to housing movement, reclaiming public space, uh, remunicipalizing utilities such as electricity or um, or, uh, you know, contestation around uh, uh, the dignity of labor, labor rights, uh, and so on, would be uh, ineffective to answer to the challenges that this new form of um, uh, capitalism, this concentration, this, uh, this unprecedented concentration of industrial power, of uh, social power and political power that big tech uh, represent and also that the smart city concept represented uh, was basically putting into crisis a lot of the strategies that were coming from radical movements but also from progressive political parties and so we thought well there is something maybe we have to go deeper and we have to try and articulate better uh, what a, an alternative project that take back the control, the democratic control of digital technologies and data and put technology at the service of people, what this can look like, how this can look like and how we can, through a kind of municipal network of cities, of radical cities, we can create knowledge inside the institutions, which is also, I mean, the core, I have to say, of the Barcelona experience and the core about rethinking cities is rethinking political power. So the core is, uh, is um, understanding a new way uh, that uh, connects public institution and, uh, and, um, uh, and perceived public space vis-a-vis -vis citizens. And of course, we started uh, thinking also from the perspective of a crisis of political representation, a crisis of democracy, a, a crisis, um, I mean, this was also immediately after the financial crisis, of course. And I mean, today we are in a moment of uh, uh, lots of crises. We have a pandemic going on, we have a climate emergency, we have an economic crisis. So this is um, 
this is still um, the, 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 the political time that we are living on. And um, basically, we, we, uh, the, the citizens at that point, and, and we saw also the, the large-scale social movements in Europe and globally that, that were basically asking for, uh, the, for a different type of politics. You know, in, in, in Spain at that time, there was the Indignados movement. I, I don't know if you remember that. I mean, these elected into power, Ada Colau, that was the first uh, female mayor of Barcelona. She came from the anti-eviction movement. Her main claim was uh, uh, housing is a right, but also she put forward a very radical agenda that, that is very socially oriented. Um, but at the same time, there was this uh, strong contestation against, um, you know, the political class at one, uh, at one level and then the financial system at the other level. And so we had to rethink the relationship between the state and the citizens. This has been the core of our experimentation in Barcelona. Um, and also we uh, understood that basically we had also to, to, to rethink what it means, you know, to deploy uh, connectivity, large scale connectivity, uh, data, and uh, technological and sensors and infrastructure in the urban fabric of the city. And what it means for managing power, but in particular, how can this uh, technology uh, be uh, put at the service of people? So in this way, we had to move away, of course, from the kind of smart city project that Evgeny was referring to, First of all, uh, away from technological determinism, technological solutionism, which we see also today all the time when we talk about platforms and about the digital economy, uh, that, you know, uh, it seems that um, with technology, you are going to solve poverty, you're going to solve climate change, you're going to make your cities better, you're going to solve everything. And uh, basically, we had to move away that kind of technology first, the top-down mentality that as, as a consequence, has the introduction of these new powerful players such as Google, such as, you know, the big tech players that come in with their solutions that usually imply also concentration of power over data, privatization of essential services and facilities, and also, you know, new business models that I mean, I've been described as surveillance capitalism, but also that you can describe as extractivist extractivist economic models. And, you know, a lot of these experiments end up um, uh, uh, leading in the situation of breaking down uh, the, eco the local economies of, of cities, of countries, and so on. So they are actually economic failures. Um, so what we have been doing in Barcelona was um, basically starting from um, taking back control over digital technology and infrastructure, and in particular, reflecting upon uh, the, the public value of data. So uh, all the time when you talk about the smart city, and also Gany uh, was talking about that before, um, you talk about infrastructures that produces uh, all the time uh, data. But the point, uh, it, it's not starting from the technology. I mean, the real question is starting from the, from the real daily problems of citizens. So instead of, you know, explaining the smart city as this kind of technological city that produces data that gets extracted by the big players, we connected the technology policy with things that really matter to people affordable housing, uh, sustainable mobility, the fight against climate change, better public health care, um, a participatory democracy, and the possibility of to devolve power to citizens in decision making. So we started from this agenda that was actually the, the, the political agenda of Barcelona, and only after we asked how can technology and data if governed in a democratic way, help us 
to transform the city into political direction that we want to go to. I think this is a fundamental shift that we have to operate. We have to put technology and our technological capacity, our, our critical infrastructures and our capacity to build also different type of infrastructure at the service of the political vision that we want to achieve. And, uh, and so when you do that, um, then you 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 realize that you know in cities you have a lot of a lot of conflicts that are happening uh for instance with, with you know with platforms such as airbnb such as uber that are now pervasive in the urban in, in, the, in the public urban space and that they are basically uh, transforming your capacity as policy maker to achieve to put forward this radical progressive policies that you want to uh, that you want to enact because if you think about Airbnb and the impact that their business model is having on affordable housing policies obviously this is huge so you do not need to be an expert on technology to understand that basically the 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 prices of housing has been um, skyrocketing because of the short-term rentals and the business model of, of companies like Airbnb. And also you don't need to be a technology expert or a data expert to understand that um, businesses like Uber are going to basically uh, transform the public transportation system and they're going to create lots of problems for gig workers which are going to be um, in a precarious working situation and environment so it was it, it became very clear that this these platforms and this business model that was based on um, on uh, monetizing and manipulating uh, personal information and data was actually having a huge impact also also in particular on the ability of cities to set their own agenda and to set their own policies and build the know-how and the capacity in the public sector to be able to drive this change. So this, this became very clear to us. And so we put forward a transformative uh, digital agenda that started uh, from, well, three elements. Maybe I, I go into these three elements and then organic can take over. Uh, the first one, of course, is participatory democracy, as I said before. And, uh, and so we, um, we started to say, okay, how we can transform institutions, public institutions, uh, in order to integrate the collective intelligence of citizens into decision making. I mean, we know that not only public institutions, I mean, many, many uh, different types of institutions today are opaque, they are corrupted. I mean, we have a lot of cases of corruption. Power is not properly distributed, but in particular, decisions are taken into closed rooms with the usual experts. Um, well, for multinationals and for big companies, it's very easy to actually enter into these closed clubs. But, you know, citizens are not part of how policy making happens. And so when Ada uh, became the mayor, she said, we are going to experiment a different type of politics, which is about participatory democracy. I mean, again, we learned from Brazil. I mean, you were the ones experimenting, uh, experimenting participatory democracy long time ago, participatory budgeting and so on. So we wanted to reva reva revitalize that tradition a bit. But in order to do that, because many people ask me, how do you make people to participate? That's not the question. I mean, I think in Brazil, you really understand me because you have huge social movements and people and communities are participating. They are active. They are building um, radical and alternative solutions. The problem is the institutional power itself. So we understood that we had to transform the institutions in order to open them up to integrate the power of communities, to integrate the collective intelligence of citizens. So this was the first experiment. How do we put participatory democracy in motion? And what we did was experimenting a hybrid model of online democracy and offline democracy in the streets. So neighborhood by neighborhood, um, a process of uh, participatory assemblies that would and help define the political agenda of the city of Barcelona. 
At the same time, we built a platform which is called Decid in Barcelona, which is an open source, decentralized um, digital platform for, for um, citizens' participation. Actually, it is built open source with a large community of developers. Uh, it has also physical spaces because, you know, participation, it's never a Facebook democracy. It's not about clicking, clicking and then give your data to the big platforms. No, it is about real participation. It is about giving um, the information and setting the process for people to understand what matters to them. I mean, to take the decisions about mobility, about culture, about housing, about, uh, you know, new public space, about climate and so on. So this, we orchestrated this large scale participatory process. Imagine 400,000 citizens participated into this policy making experiment and 70% of the proposals that became the action plan of the city of Barcelona came directly from citizens. So as you can imagine, this process is not a linear, it is not easy, it is contested, it is conflict, it requires lots of courage also for policymakers, and it requires political will to engage in such, in such a participatory approach. And let me say that the two main projects that were, um, let's say, uh, transformed really the city of Barcelona in the last uh, uh, four to five years when ADA was in, in, in government, the first one was really about urban planning. I mean, redefining the city of Barcelona with the green transition in mind, with the ecological transition in mind. So this project of the super blocks, um, uh, you may heard about that. So Barcelona created 16 um, districts uh, that uh, are self-sustainable um, districts um, where we removed cars from the city center. So in this way, we recuperated 60% of the public space that before was occupied by cars and through a participatory process that involved urbanists, designers, residents, uh, urban planners, and also businesses, local businesses, uh, we were able to redefine the use of public space, mixing social housing, mixing new activities that were uh, important for the local residents, um, new artisanal businesses, and lots of green space. And this also meant uh, redefining the mobility plan of the city of Barcelona. Of course, uh, tri tri uh, having three times the amount of bikes, uh, electric bicycles, moving to electric mobility, uh, sharing mobility. So in this way, also, you could see that you are tackling so many different problems. I mean, you're talking probably about gentrification, but you're also looking at uh, better air quality and pollution and new forms of mobility. And the impact this has on the city is huge. So this was like the biggest uh, you know, project that we achieved through a participatory way, also using technology in a very radical way because we were putting sensors to measure, uh, you know, the air quality, rethinking also um, waste collection. Uh, and, you know, we were using technology and we were producing a lot of data and I get to the data part. Uh, the, other, the other big project was about uh, renewable energies. So we created a municipal company, a public company that was producing solar, solar energy. And today, all the buildings in Barcelona are powered by social energy, by renewable energy, which is produced by this municipal company. This is what Evgeny was referring to as real municipalization. And on top of that, we provided incentive, fiscal incentives and a crowd uh, a crowdsourcing campaign so that citizens could participate in the production of this solar energy by putting solar panels in their public in their private home and then connecting through a distributed grid to the main um, you know company energy company of the city of Barcelona. In this way, we were also tackling problems such as um, poverty, um, 
energy poverty. So people that were, uh, could not afford to pay the bill at the end of the month. And also rethinking this kind of energy use and uh, energy distribution system in the city. So just to say that the main projects that came out of this process are not technological in itself. They are about transforming the city. They are about transforming uh, the, the, you know, the mobility, the way we live, the way we produce energy, and also the way we uh, participate as communities. I just let me go to the point of data, because as you probably know, I'm uh, pretty <laughs> fixated with this issue. And I think that, you know, in the future, who will control data? And of course, the underlying uh, technologies and infrastructures that make data uh, possible to become so valuable will set the rules of the game. I mean, we'll decide, you know, we'll control the um, global value chain of the future. And so we basically experimented the new model that looked at data as a public infrastructure. So we said data is a kind of meta utility. It is like uh, water, it is like the streets, it is like the air we breathe. It is a fundamental critical urban infrastructure and we contribute to the production of value by producing data and we need to reclaim it as a public good, as a common good, as a public infrastructure. And uh, so we have to basically change absolutely the way that this is happening now in smart cities because now all the time that you procure a service, so you do a public procurement in the city hall and you procure a service, I mean, it could be the telephone uh, companies or it could be your uh, waste services, waste management service or even um, mobility, anything. You produce a lot of data because, of course, these services are, um, are delivered using technology, software and producing lots of data. And this data is the fundamental know-how that allow you to then, you know, in real time manage the city and also be able to learn from what you do and then be able to actually run the city. So we said this is a fundament, this is a really valuable metal facility. So we take, we have to take back this control in a democratic manner, the control of data. So we started from changing the way we were doing procurement. I know this horrible world, totally unsexy. It is the core of what we do in government, in fact, you know, spending citizen money to procure services. So we introduced uh, data sovereignty clauses in the public procurement contracts so that any provider in the city of Barcelona that was providing services through a public procurement contract paid by taxpayers' money had to give back data to the city hall in machine readable format, which means data that can be consumed by your artificial intelligence engines, by computers, and that, you know, if you create the right algorithms, then it can create valuable new services or valuable new ideas or valuable models for you to be able then to manage the city. So this was the first thing. The second thing uh, that we have been doing was to go beyond that. So once we have reclaimed, in a sense, the public control of data through public procurement, well, first of all, we went through a very large scale um, uh, change inside the administration. So for instance, I hired 65 new people. I mean, we have to say this, that you know, if the public administration has to work without people, I mean, without talented young people which have the skills and capacity to do something, it is very hard that they're going to be able to do something. So I hired uh, 65 new people. We put up a office of data analytics, which is now 40 people working inside the city of Barcelona with the right skills, getting back the data. And then we experimented with some radical models, you know, using decentralized and private financing technologies, such as the distributed ledger technology, through the Decode project, where we basically uh, gave back the control of the data to citizens. So we bet on, on this model where the data is not controlled by Google or by big uh, tech companies, but it's also not controlled by the state in a centralized manner, but it is controlled by citizens themselves that can decide what data they can keep private, they want to keep private. So we also put cryptography 
as a human right. I mean, cryptographic standards, new cryptography that enable people to, to have privacy and security. And we have to train public officials on new cryptography and cryptographic standards. And then what data they want to share, with whom they want to share with data, and on what terms. And this is, for us, a, a, a new deal on data, I mean, a, a social pact on data that redistributes the power over you know the essential um essential uh, let's say uh currency of the digital economy which is the data that we all produced that instead of only creating private um private revenue private rent for a few players can finally produce public value and then if you open up this data after of course you preserve privacy security and ethics by design and of course we're very lucky in europe to have the data protection directive as a regulation regulatory framework i know you have the marco civil but it's not quite the same but anyways you could also apply the gdpr which is uh, you know at least a frame a juridical framework that protects our fundamental rights as, as citizens in the digital age, then we can open up this data and open it up to uh, local enterprises, social enterprises, social movements, journalists, citizens themselves and companies locally that can use this data in order to help us producing AI-driven and data-driven services in healthcare, in education, in mobility, in you know, in urban planning, and help innovate the city in this way. So I, I leave it here. I mean, I said a lot of things. Just to say, I, I just want to say that, of course, Evgeny can discuss, for instance, now questions related to to the big struggles that we are facing that go beyond the city level. Because, I mean, let's face it, we are living with the concentration of power, which is unprecedented. We have to, uh, to give a response, you know, to this kind of, to, the, to, 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 to the, the concentration of current capitalism at a sovereign national scale. For us, at a European scale initially, but also globally, we have to be able to pull in enough investment and enough capacity to build a different technological industry that it's not exploitative that preserve um you know the rights of workers the rights of citizens our fundamental uh, rights and liberties so it is a big mission to put technology at the service of people and uh, and create a kind of technological uh let's say humanism but at the same time, and so this is going to require, you know, antitrust, uh, a new geopolitical awareness, uh, uh, taxing the big tech, reclaiming back our data governance at a large scale. But I want to say that what we do at a very local level, at a city level, at a community level, here matters a lot. We can create new public policies and new models that are a start. I mean, that are a start for an alternative that then can be, you know, put in a network with other cities around the world, as I'm doing now, for instance, with the United Nations Cities Coalition for Digital Rights and collaborating with other cities around the world that, you know, enable us to experiment radically, I mean, democratically and radically new model that then can grow. So I, I'm a believer, although it seems, you know, it, there is a disconnect that actually municipal connected movements, which have the, the right framing and the right political, of course, we have to take political power first, but we can experiment with this new model that can open up new possibilities for uh, progressives. And I think, you know, we can learn from some of the experiments that are described in the book and a little bit about what I told you today to move towards that direction. Francesca, nenhuma vontade de interromper você. É, eu aplaudi aquela era um símbolo de aplauso hum. incrível, incrível. Francesca, teria... I'd like to applaud you. I'd like to hear you talking for more one year. I'll tell <laughs> people that we unfortunately can't stay longer now, but at some moment she would have to leave. But I'd like to thank you. In behalf of uh, Ubu, our publishing house, but 
I'd like to ask you about the experience of Bologna and the experience of a participatory democracy. I don't know if I can suggest things like this in real time, but it was really great to hear you. So, uh, talking about this book, um, Rafael Zanata wrote the beginning in the introduction, which are two uh, researcher, a uh, wonderful researcher, and they were doing this through Lula administration. And we're going to be showing futurely on our institution, which is also called culturalism, which is about um, uh, intellectual um, talking as we are doing out, which puts, as Morozov just said, uh, for us to understand that the technology is something that has to be in our hands too. It's not only the control of uh, biggest tax, all uh, companies that seem cool like Google and all uh, colorful, but the true thing is it, they have uh, the control of everything, like a huge control. So we, we can know about that if we research it's it's crazy oh okay but then i can see through apps how i can go through streets and all of you know but it's not something free for you to see and understand how data works it's just an example as francesca just said which is the mobilization right and, uh, and traffic um, so for you, Eugenie and Francesca, we have a lot of comments here and, and people say, oh my gosh, this book is open my mind. And Gabriela also said, like, I want to know Morozov, I, I'm seeing, I'm watching the live too. And they say it's a, a great um, talking that we are having here. And it's true that in Sao Paulo, you know, the, the traffic got huge. <laughs> it's something serious that we have to talk about. And in English, in description, if you have, if you're interested, if you want to know about the uh, origin of the language they talk in, you can do it. I'm not going to read everything, but it's a lot of comments um uh, saying congratulations and they liking what you're saying i'm not going to start the question yet but i'm going to pass it to Morozov. francesca you still have seven minutes but Morozov, if you let me let me just ask francesca first one question and mm -hmm. then uh, you can keep on going francesca um seems simple and maybe naive but let me ask you do you do you trust that, for example, the the big companies are controlling everything? Someone asked about that, and it's related to it. So, do you think we can be optimistic if we talk about, for example, Brazil, which is very hard to administrate? We are in a um, we are in a different situation which we have uh, to be careful, right? Um, so we are seeing more hatred than uh, being happy than feeling happy. Everything related to politics. So unfortunately, it opened up for uh, groups that are thinking of uh, um, paying attention to it and being negative somehow. Can you talk about mm -hmm. that? Well, yes, maybe briefly, and I'm sure Evgeny can talk more about the tech populism himself. Um, I think, you know, from my side, of course, the main problem is that the core of the business model of these tech companies, which, as I said before, is based on the extraction, manipulation, monetization of personal information and data 
uh, for lots of different mean, means. I mean, from uh, the political space to the commercial space to um, you know to algorithms that really shape uh, uh, our life and have an impact, uh, as we saw. Exactly. I mean, the question, for instance, can refer to the uh, anti-racial uh, movement in, in the U.S., where we saw that, you know, algorithms had discriminatory um, characteristics when it comes to race, when it comes to your socioeconomic background, to where you're from, to your political thinking. I mean, it is really um, a crisis of... Um, of democracy as we as we as we mean it, uh, and this is the very core of uh, the business model, which then spreads, you know, fake news, conspiracy theory, uh, lots of hate, uh, um, hate speech online, and so on. These are externalities of the of the tech giants that then we have to clean up as society. And at the moment, we do not have the means and the investment and the capacity to build our alternative type of infrastructures that also have are built on different economic models, different type of incentives, and are directed towards different goals in society. I mean, I've been talking a lot about the Green Deal, you know, how we have to decarbonize the economy, how we have to shift to a different ecological model, affordable housing, public health care, how we rethink our cities. This is not things that the big tech itself will do for us. We're going to have to do it reclaiming back public power. So it is a political issue at the end. And so I think, you know, uh, my answer, and also this business model fuels populism. I mean, it, it fuels that kind of right-wing uh, populism. We saw it. It is part of it. And also, I mean, it, it fuels a lot of anger from people because it creates a lot of polarization, in particular in the economy. I mean, let's think about the pandemic. Most of us have been completely screwed by the pandemic. Lots of small businesses are closing. We are literally injecting public money in the economy to save lots of businesses. And the big tech have accumulated a market power which is unprecedented. I mean, the tech, the tech stocks the big U.S. big tech stocks now, they are more valuable than the entire uh, European stock market. So, uh, I mean, we are creating billionaires of, the, of a kind of, you know, plutocracy here. So, this is, of course, something we have to solve politically. I mean, we have to decide as a society where we gonna wanna go, how we redistribute economic power, how we redistribute political power, and how we are building a, a, a tech society, because of course, I mean, these are going to be the critical infrastructures of the future. When we are talking about chips, artificial intelligence, supercomputing, data, and so on, this is the building blocks of our society. It will affect all industries. All industries equally. And that's why now we have a new geopolitical question, you know, a new geopolitical, a new Cold War between US and China and so on for who is going to control this critical technology and then how the global value chains of the futures are going to play out. So, I, I mean, for me, this is a question of political uh, decision and political sovereignty and economic sovereignty and technological sovereignty. And they are together. You cannot separate them. And so this is a big debate that is happening now in Europe, in particular with the kind of like recovery fund and the EU next generation and, and shaping a political Europe now. I mean, these are these issues are at the very core of it. So for me, unfortunately, we cannot take back our political sovereignty if we're not going to solve the question of who is controlling these fundamental critical infrastructures of the future. And well. So, of course, uh, you know, there is a lot we have to do, a lot we can do, but also a lot, as, as I said already, so I don't want to repeat myself, I don't believe only in this kind of grand, you know, um, pictures for the future. I think at the end, the solutions are going to be practiced, are going to be practiced in communities, in movements, in cities, and so on. And, you know, and, and, and of course, it is also going to be about resisting to some of the political changes that we are seeing now, and then putting forward this kind of um, 
positive alternatives. And I mean, I mean, also the syllabus project that you may discuss later. I mean, at the end, it is a different type of knowledge infrastructure that serve, you know, the purpose of finding a new type of contents in society. It's a kind of new public service. It has to be nourished as such, which is about creating new public institutions new institutional forms with the new social imagination and the infrastructure the, with the technological infrastructures that we need. So I'm afraid I really do have to go. So I'm afraid I'm going to leave you in the very good hands of Evgeny now. But thank you so much for hosting me here. Francesca, reitero o convite que eu fiz no começo. Que no ano que vem, depois... Francesca, when we started, I invited you to come to Brazil after the pandemic is over. So I would love to have you and, Fran and Eusegini here in Sao Paulo. So it would be lovely to have you here in Sao Paulo. And um, Rosa Luxemburg Foundation would be so pleased to keep this debate there are plenty of questions that i'll send you in written form later unfortunately we won't be able to ask you all of the questions but i'll be sending them to you later thank you for being here with us thanks so today. much for organizing this and thanks to Loza luxembourg and i want to say hi to my friend uh, sergio madeo if he's listening <laughs> bye bye thanks so much Eugenie, a gente continuando aqui. É... Uh, Eugenie, so let's carry on. Francesca talked about digital sovereignty, which is a core concept for this debate. And in the book, it's one of the most important concepts you discuss. If we want to have fair cities or safe militarized cities, if we want to have democratic spaces or company controlled spaces, if we want to have organized societies or sustainable societies, and this is core, and I would like you to talk more about this concept. Before Francesca left, she also talked about syllabus. I would love to hear on possible alternatives that we could um, envision. And the, the first question from um, people, uh, Eduardo Muzu Messi, uh, I don't know if I mispronounced your name. So other than free technology and the data that you've discussed in the book, do you know um, technology based on national graphics um, that foster people participation and uh, territory participation in decision making progresses. And also, what's your experience on digital mapping? And do you know uh, platforms that enable people par uh, participation in um, urban planning? Eugenie, if you feel like uh, speaking Portuguese, feel free. And uh, people who are um, following the English uh, link, they're going to uh, hear the translators. But if you feel like speaking English, feel free. But if you speak Belarusian, we won't be able to translate your, your views. Um, of course, we have the, the options between English that I can speak super fast and Portuguese that I can make some mistakes, but then I believe that I will speak la more slowly. So I would like to start by talking about syllabus. On the one hand, it's a very nice website on the other hand, it's actually an attempt, a critical attempt that I've been making with some partners. And we're there to criticize the dominant, the mainstream logic for digital economy or we could also say the economy of attention. 
because the best content online they're never available to users and the reason is that there's a different logic to it which is a logic based on popularity popularity in uh, digital platforms it creates condition for data and that's the logic of youtube twitter facebook and basically there are better content however for example the video for this event that is going to be published later on the video is there is going to be broadcasted but the problem is this video is not going to be recommended by youtube algorithms because it's unlikely that it's going to create a mass or a huge amount of views and because of not having such a huge number of views it's not interesting for youtube therefore syllabus is a project that i've developed in partnership with other um, other people from different countries and we are trying to establish a different logic by resorting to algorithms we have identified and uh, uh, content such as podcasts articles academic articles to discuss important issues such as climate change populism ai so we have more than 60 themes that we focus on considering syllabus our goal is to create a mechanism to broadcast and to share all of that knowledge that knowledge that is produced by universities worldwide by writers and authors and intellectuals worldwide and unfortunately it's hard that these people uh, stand out considering the current scenario it's hard to find those people it's hard to find them systematically you may bump into a twitter link that connects you to an article a very interesting article however that doesn't happen every single day it happens once in a blue moon therefore syllabus is an attempt to establish something which is regular to share good information therefore every week you can get once a week you can get an email part of our newsletter that will be sent to you and will be sending to everybody who has a subscription to our website and you can get the best content best videos best articles and you can also tailor it to your needs to your interests and it's totally tailored to each user you can decide which themes which issues you're interested at interested in because this element of personalization of tailoring is not based on the logic of surveillance and considering that it's not based in the silicon valley logic where they observe human behavior in a way to manipulate people eventually 
and not only to manipulate but to model behavior syllabus doesn't monitor people's behavior we believe in user autonomy and uh, you can say i feel like getting articles on um, climate change but i want no articles on populism and this is based on uh, user decision this is a project that uh, we've been working on for a year now nowadays there are over 20 20,000 users subscribed to the syllabus project and people from everywhere, all corners of the world. And for me as an intellectual, it's a good way of showing how and in a very pragmatic way that there are new and other possibilities for digital economy. And that's the same argument that we defend in the book. And here, what we criticize is not technology. We're not against intelligent systems. Uh, we're not against algorithms. We can imagine highly intelligent and smart systems that we can use for different uh, purposes, purposes other than the ones that are being uh, used now. And uh, basically they're done in an arbitrary way and imposed by the logic of digital economy. We can imagine uh, an a smart city, but also solidarity using solidarity, using mechanisms to coordinate social issues that are not based on the market idea I logic. So nowadays all online platform platforms like Uber, Airbnb, they actually They are different ways of coordinating society, but they are very limited where the market, or we can also say that the pricing systems used to make it easier business in the market economy. So, Francesca and I as well imagine that a system, a different system is possible where the platform themselves can make it easier to co coordinate social behavior. And it can be motivated by society, but not the motivation of profit. We, it's necessary that in cities, a project like this, it's, it's even harder to make it in a national level. So it would be much easier to do this in the city level. So that's why cities are so important in this scenario, in this political battle, because cities are places where other systems, economic, social forces can be tested in real life. Otherwise, it's more it seems that we are going to follow the logic of a Silicon Valley. And it is 
connected to the neoliberalism and the digital economy. And it's not necessary to follow this logic. We have other institutions, other infrastructure that we can use. In the case of the project syllabus, it's important that we use many Google structure and Amazon as well, because they are companies that control the resources that are more most important in the world. They have control over AI, they control computers. And actually, the reason why we don't have many other projects like syllabus, it is because it's because some some companies want us to pay much than they deserve for this type of a service of the project. We have a very particular way of uh, operating. So young people who have this kind of idealism, people who want to change the world, they I think they should try to create um, a social move, movement instead of creating companies. So young people are encouraged to create startups instead of creating participating social movements. because it happens because young people want to make it want to participate in the digital world and so is it is inevitable that people are going to choose this type of organization because we have so many budgets so um so many costs so it's impossible to survive in this type of economy where people are competing. And because of costs, that's why people find it hard to change the direction. But changing direction is a core thing to, to the problem. And I believe we have to find a way to help the digital infrastructure which are not part of the interest of Google and other companies. So with this type of um, intellectual property, we should imagine the infrastructure that we are more expensive for us, such as um, intelligent institution in the and the systems that um, invest a lot in this sector. In my opinion, that's why we should act in different levels in the national, in the national and local level. And for me, this is the only solution that's possible for the economical and political problem that affects us at the moment. And in this way, we can reach or rather we could um, actually have an attitude that is not technophobia, not te technophobic which is the project of the left wing and the progressist movement because they are trying to find a way to use technologies because what we have now is our technology like google and facebook but they are not desirable for the left wing movement com muitos dos debates que a gente tem aqui no Brasil também, e eu estava tentando acompanhar enquanto a gente conversa também os comentários, é, tem acadêmicos, tem gente que estuda, tem gente falando 
usar o livro e esse debate em si como parte de um trabalho. And there are people a lot asking about it on chat and comments, and there are connection with everything that we've been studying here in Brazil. So I'm going to read another question for you. Oh, which people they are are watching. So they said pandemic has some service to collect the data. So do you believe that capitalism is going to change this because of economy, which is related to that? So uh, she was asking Francesca too, but Francesca needed to go. She had something else to do. So it's the uh, question saying, you saying the importance of the autonomy, like so sovereignty data, right? But if we uh, put that together with all the uh, network, which is global, we have a cable and infrastructure, all controlled by um, private uh, company. All uh, cable system and uh, the Navy and ships and everything is connected to that. So two questions. Uh, one, one thing. And they also comment about your Portuguese great Portuguese that you have in. They say congratulations for your, for your Portuguese. Thank you very much that you make an effort to communicate in Portuguese. This is kind of you. Well, I learned Portuguese so because of that. I learned, yes. I learned Portuguese okay. so for this Let me start reason. with the second so um, question about infrastructure. which most of them so are I'll private this companies. question about uh, private property. And here we have we to remember, remember that one thing that happened, there is a relation which puts very close relationship between which is interesting uh, which is about the meaning and the global economy of the, the global economy Demonia, and the possibility that. and the possibility of structures economic and digital for vigilance global e okay. isso é um feito que é uh, muito frequente, não é uh, analisado e mencionado uh, pela uh, analistas uh, da economia global e sobretudo da uh, poder enorme dos Estados Unidos, uh, que tem esta relação entre a uh, possibilidade de uh, monitorar uh, tudo Uh, todas as redes, todos os uh, cabos, uh, é o feito que eles dominam o uh, nível uh, global. E, em vez, agora, uh, a discussão uh, global é sobre a uh, China, uh, a possibilidade uh, das uh, infraestruturas. And so we have uh, the issue about China, which is monitoring and its economic issue. I think the size of the global surveillance on behalf of the United States is very big. And here we should consider as well that there is there are many battles on the field that are that could be considered lost. And we still have ones that are still running for example the cables this is this one is very difficult and it would be very difficult to win it nowadays but this in an um, international level requires a cooperation among countries to build different structures, chaos that are created by companies like Google. And this type of a cooperation 
which is global, it doesn't exist. And it or this is very difficult to find. We can imagine China as a as a force in this scenario, but it's hard to think in the same way as it was possible 10 years ago with the cooperation of different countries in the global south. But nowadays, to be honest, I think it's a bit difficult. But we have other battles to fight. For example, the 5G battle. With this technology nowadays, we can create different, not only in between the United States and the Europe, but also with the Chinese. And in my opinion, this is very important. But nowadays, we have also opportunity in the IEA field. But besides all those battles, we also have a battle that is starting, which shape it would be good to give to shape those battles to promote different agendas with different goals and um, get different results. Something which is fair, but this so is something, something that's very um, common. It's not so in a, in important. Common, it's a common but we need to, to think of we a justification, should. new justification, to explain the, to why on the capitalism, uh, capitalism and uh, neoliberalism are uh, uh, don't have the are not capable of uh, managing those infrastructure because this is an argument that i i make um in the new book that i'm doing which is going to be published i don't know when but the argument i uh, make uh, uh, in the book is about capitalism creating conditions conditions to manage the um, different movements because of this preference it's only one model in the market which also has lots of problems but really is a the structure of technology gives another condition of uh, to po make possible the collaboration happen to happen and to solve problems too this is important if you think of the word today because we have lots of problem as uh, climate change for example and for me this is a uh, sign a very important sign which is strong showing that capitalism is not um, able to solve those kind of problem and that's why we have to criticize what those digital infrastructure are doing that we can use it to um, um, organize a different word they are not um, accessible. They are not able for them to do it. So they, uh, if you can understand it, this is, those are not good arguments for you to say that it, it's going, it, it's working. We have to change the argument. I don't know if we still have time. Well, we had. Um, we thought that we could uh, uh, 
You still have a time to go. We still have a 30 minutes to go. Oh, okay. It's because I'm a, I'm a tired, a little tired. Okay, so I am a, let me do something. I'm going to open here. So then we can finish. Morozov, it's, it's talking to us in Italy. And here in Brazil, is we started three o'clock and there it's eight o'clock. So it's a difference of time. We have lots of questions, but there's no time to ask every, every each and every question. So I want you to thank you, which is important to say that we had uh, translations uh, by three interpreters, fine Tony Consultoria uh, Enterprise and in the company, Hani, Susana, and Raquel. We also have uh, the staff help too. And uh, also to tell you that we're going to have uh, the book here uh, uh, able for you to buy on the site. Okay. We, uh, our idea is to give you knowledge about that so we can construct uh, good things and uh, common good for everyone. So I'm talking about this uh, published house, which we have a Microsoft book. If you can look at the book, it's great. It looks beautiful. 